Why? Yeah. Oh, yes, finally. Look who it f***ing is, Jack. <laughs> oh, no. Better late than ever. All right, all right. No, I just wanted to, I wanted Franco to take the rain and, and you know, see how he would go. <laughs> it, it, it was pretty organized, see how he would go on his own, um, you know, get, getting ready for the future. Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and I'm on my best behavior today after seeing just how tough the stewards are on people who dare cross the line. Fortunately, today we have a driver who kept on the good side of the Austrian stewards last weekend. He is the very first driver to have joined the podcast twice yet it seems like he's in a completely different position from when we spoke to him with a win in F3 since we last spoke to him and a podium in Austria. Great to have you back, Franco Colapinto, and with around 100 times as many Argentinian Twitter and Instagram followers than before, I think. Hello, Jim. Uh, nice to meet you again, of course. Really nice to be, to be chatting with you guys once again and after such a long time. So, yeah, really happy to be here. Yeah, it's uh, all changed for you. We're really excited to catch up and speak to you properly about how F3 is going. But also, I have to welcome back the F1 Feeder Series editor, Percy Wolf, to remind that everybody that it wasn't just racing at the Red Bull ring. There was uh, other stuff going on at the Hungaro ring. Welcome back to the podcast, Percy. What a busy time it's been since we last had you on talking about Frecker in Monaco. Yeah, thank you, Jim, and uh, hello, Franco, and hello, hello, everyone. Well, for sure, so many things have changed, and uh, especially in Freke since last time I came here. And yeah, can't wait to talk about all what happened in this uh, this weekend, this marvelous but also so chaotic world of Fido <laughs> series. It's got a bit crazy, hasn't it? But before we get into it, a quick reminder to like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. If you don't have time to listen or watch each week, you can still find some great short videos on our channels with our best bits. And if you are listening to the audio-only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. You can leave a rating on Spotify, and we've received a bunch more since last week, so thank you very much. You can also review us on Apple Podcasts, and to entice you in, any reviews we receive will be read out on the show. Don't say anything too bad, guys. But thank you to everyone who rates us. It really does help us out. We're going to have to start out with Formula 2. And the penalties and everything this weekend all started with track limits violations, deleting lap times for almost all the drivers in qualifying. Franco... This seemed to be the stewards putting their foot down. Was anything specific said to you drivers about it going into the weekend? Well, no, I mean, uh, we knew since the beginning that Austria and Red Bull Ring is one of the, let's say, most chaotic drugs instead of in drug limits and in, instead of some drug like Imola, for example, that you have a, a curve and then straight afterwards a, a gravel drug that is just much easier to control. Here you, you have many corners where you can actually gain an advantage by doing track limits. Some mm -hmm. other corners are not, but yeah, many of those, many of those track limits, uh, you, you can actually gain a few tens. So in qualifying, it's, it's actually quite an important uh, job that the stewards have to, to be on top of that. And, and they work clearly, uh, maybe too much in the races, maybe, uh, I wouldn't say too much, but they would say that they were not, uh, consistent in, in, enough and some of the drivers were still doing drug limits but not getting penalties and some others were quite careful but then they go off just a little bit and they got a, a really harsh penalty which is actually not very fair uh, of course that the rules are the rules but uh, also when you have a judge of fact it's, it's quite difficult to 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 be 100 percent correct because in the end it's the eye of a, of a human you know so it's a really difficult thing this of the truck limits we've seen it before and we know that this year the, the stewards of the FIA are just much more harsh with it we saw it in Bahrain now here so yeah 
Do you think some of that inconsistency can cause problems, though? Because you're right that some of the tracks like Austria and, well, for Formula 2 in two weeks' time, uh, Le Castellet, which is basically one yeah. massive runoff, when you go to Silverstone and we saw lots of, we saw some track limit deletions, but not at every single corner. It's very inconsistent. Do you think that that inconsistency between tracks where it, the limit, the, the limit of the track isn't the same every single weekend is mm. causing some issues where drivers think, oh, I can go off the track and then they go to the next race and they can't. Um, I mean, I'm sure that there is no that they cannot go out and that this year they are really looking at it. They have cameras everywhere and they have people everywhere looking at if some car is going out or not. Um, in, For example, in Silverstone, when you are doing a track limit, it was quite difficult to win an advantage if you are doing it in the races because maybe someone is pushing you off. If you are doing it for practice, probably you did a mistake in in, stop, in cops, for example, and, and you just got a snap, so you have to use a runoff area. But you are not really doing it to win any lap time because it's you are anyway bottoming in the curves and, and you are not really gaining anything. Um, but in Austria, the thing is that you, you can actually win quite a little bit of time and in such a short track where the, the, the gaps are so, so little, so small, um, just by winning half attempts, by using a little bit more of that curve and just running a little bit wide on the exit, getting a bit earlier on, on power, uh, I mean, you can just win a couple of, of positions by that. So I have to say that in Austria was a, was a, a thing to have a look at. And of course, the stewards did a, a good job there. Uh, I would say that in F2, maybe it was was a little bit over the limit, I would say. For example, they were putting a lot of penalties in T1, um, where you actually have a sausage curve. Uh, you cannot really win any any lap time by doing that. Um, and basically, they said that the the width of the car from the white line to the sausage curve, it was bigger than the width of the car. So if you were on top of that sausage curve, yeah. you had a truck limit. You were doing a truck limit violation. Uh, so many lap times were deleted because of that. But then, for example, you see the pole lap in F2, and and in the pole lap is fully over the sausage car, but he didn't got his lap time deleted. So in the end, it's you know those things that are just really difficult to control. And uh, I mean, we all know that the easiest thing is just to have gravel drops everywhere, and it will make <laughs> the race, you know, the steps. Old school. That's what Franco Colapinto wants. Gravel traps at old school. I understand it though, and this is the second podcast in a row we've had to speak about it. Percy, we saw more five second penalties this weekend than in an online lobby of the F1 video game with strict rules enforced. Is this level of racing where you see five second penalties and thinking that that driver is going to drop down, like we saw with Behrman in F3? Does this ruin the racing for you, or is it time that the stewards got strict? Uh, I don't know if it ruined the racing, as you say, but at least, uh, as, uh, as you said, it's unlike on some other tracks, the track limits were clear. The limit was the white line. You have four wheels outside of this line. Your lap uh, is cancelled, or you get a warning, or whatever. But really, what bothered me a bit more this weekend was uh, the delay of the penalties, because... Uh, in, in Formula 2, Théo Pourcher had to wait several hours uh, to get his podium confirmed because one of his track limits infringement was, were, was counted twice. I mean, mm. how can it happen at such a, a professional level? We are talking about the main feeder series of Formula 1, and uh, but it happened also in Formula 1 because uh, with the with the Sergio Perez incident in qualifying where he has been able to go to Q3 while he had cut corner. And I don't have any problems with track limits at least as a as a as a fan <laughs> for a driver it must be a bit more frustrating i, I can i can guess but uh, for the the race towards should be able to get all the informations in in what in one fraction of a second uh, yeah this weekend it was a bit of a clown show sometimes because it should be more automatic with some electronic captors uh, i don't know but uh, Fortunately, it has surely not equaled the level of uh, Freke last year in Red Bull Ring, where drivers got penalized uh, three days, four days after the race. But uh, but still, in my sense, in uh, a, the, the decisions were really much too long to take. Yeah, I can imagine just how frustrating it would have been for, Perry, yeah, for all the drivers you mentioned, 
for Perez, for Cher, for Daruvala uh, in particular, <laughs> which was just very difficult for him to... Well, it's, this is what I find frustrating, and I'm, I'm the host. I shouldn't really put my opinions down, but I went to Spa. I don't know if I've even told the story in this podcast. I went to Spa 2008, where Hamilton and Massa had... Hamilton and Raikkonen, I think it was actually. Raikkonen crashed on the last lap or very late. And mm. Massa had the win given to him because Hamilton got a penalty after the race. But when I was there, I watched the podium celebrations. So the fans in Austria watched Vashore and Daruvala on the podium taking trophies and then find yeah. out, no, no, they didn't win the race. That to me yeah. is where I think that's a problem. Like that, Imagine watching football and the World Cup and then you see, oh, Argentina have won the World Cup and then you wake up uh, like the next day and find out, oh, no, no, they didn't. France won the World Cup. You'd be thinking, well, what did okay, I watch? No, it's great. It's a great, uh, great <laughs> thing. It happens in this, in this way. <laughs> the issue is uh, the systems of the I mean, uh, you, you, this level, you cannot keep using people to, to, to just uh, have this communication with the stewards saying, this guy did a drug limit, this guy didn't. So it's just a lot of things going on and a lot of things that can go wrong while all these communications are happening. And I mean, not going too, too, too far away, for example, last year in, in Formula Regional, uh, the penalties for drug limits were, I think, to 17 or 18 cars, uh, but four days after the race for drug limits, so penalties of 10 seconds or 15 seconds for drug limits, like they applied it uh, around four days after the race. So it's like uh, it should be a system much more easy and much more quick to, to show to the drivers when they are doing truck limits. Uh, I think in MotoGP, it's, it's much easier the way that they are doing it and it's quite quite good also the penalties that they are applying to the drivers, for example. I know it's completely different, but uh, it looks much more simple um, to have some kind of technology that is saying this one is up, this one is out and this one is not instead of having an, an eye of a human that can also do a mistake, you know? Yeah, I will stress that we, when we spoke to uh, Tom Gaymore and Jack Aitken last week, that they also had some valid points just about manpower. And when you go down to the lower levels, it's just not as simple. We don't have, as we spoke about before, we don't have the Hawkeye solution in place that you can mm. have at every single track, which would ultimately fix some of these things. Just on the penalties, though, final thing on Formula 2, because there's so much to speak about at the moment. We saw Vashore lose his win, and we saw Daruvala then be the winner, but then he lost the win because of the team drying the track ahead of his grid box. That got Logan Sargent to win, who only finished in P3 originally. And then yeah. Roberto Merry, who actually finished P3, Finish P3. No. Yeah, yeah. So Murray finished P- P2. He was going to win the race because uh, uh, Berger ran out of fuel. That was it, yeah. Uh, but, but he got a five-second place penalty. It's five-second uh, five second penalty. So in the end, he was, I think, P5. But with all the penalties, he went back to the podium. Yeah, so it was just it was just a bit crazy. Are these penalties justified for you, Franco? Do you think, especially, I want to focus on the technicality ones. The track limits we've already done. I think we've, we've put that to yeah. bed. But Daruvala's one, when his team were doing something that he didn't do anything wrong. And then mm. Vashore had the, the vettel Hungaroring incident with just not having enough fuel in the car. And that is a basic problem. But mm. yeah, I, I for me, that one's a bit more confusing because it was wet. Mm. So I was surprised that uh, he wasn't, like he ran out of fuel still. Like, how? What do you? Yeah. What do you? What's your view on these? On these sorts of technical problem, uh, technical infringements, and how massively impactful yeah. they can be on the driver? I mean, in my opinion, is I mean, they are, there are some that are right, there are some that are wrong, but basically, the the worst is for the spectator, for the one watching on the TV. It's just really confusing uh, to see a guy that is finishing P10 to then. Actually, you see the results in F2 and he finished P5. Um, for example, Jake, uh, in for, from a number four, he won five places uh, just by post-race penalties. Which is great for so, Van Amers for, right? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's great, but then it's just really confusing. And uh, to have a guy that has finished second, that then he got a penalty that finished P5, and then he's finishing back on the podium. 
it's just really weird for the one that, has, that is watching and that doesn't understand really well how it works uh, to understand why all this is happening. And to be honest, it looks, it looks a bit amateur, you know, and it's such a professional and high level that these things should be, I don't know if avoid or should have been taking a decision earlier during the race. Maybe have, I don't know, the drivers could have been given some uh, penalties during the races instead of uh, having them afterwards. So then all this mess shouldn't have happened. Um, or, I don't know, in the Dark Wallace space, maybe a, a, a fine for the team because the driver didn't do anything wrong, to be honest. Uh, of course, Bershors is another thing because he couldn't actually complete the scrutiny here. Um, but yeah, it's just, it was just a really weird race. It was good to watch, but then with all the penalties, you know, you lose a little bit the, the way how it went. I, I like to say for the Darivala incident, uh, it, it's not the fault of the driver, but, and it's the fault of the team, of course, of the mechanics that dried up the, 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 the race, the, the place position, the, the position on the grid. And it gave an advantage to, to Darivala. It gave an, an advantage for the start. So, uh, 20 second penalty is a lot. Is a lot gonna, for I was sure. going to say, Percy, did it give him a 20 second yeah. advantage off the line? He hasn't been 20 seconds <laughs> just for that. But uh, I mean, I, I haven't uh, read the rule book, but uh, I think it must be there. And uh, that's a stupid mistake from, from Prema, but mm. from Prema, but uh, there will again an advantage. And yeah, I mean, it, it's the same like the, sec- the five second penalties for track limits. The drivers have not gained five seconds mm. overall. Uh, by cutting the corners and all that, but there still need to be some some strict penalties because uh, otherwise there's no consequence for 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 that. So yeah, and about Versho, uh, the disqualification is, is sad for him because he has done a, an amazing race. But it's a it's a classic one like uh, Vettel in Hungary in 2021. Uh, it's a pity, but there was not uh, enough fuel left. And uh, yeah, it has always, be, always been the case in motorsport to, to get this qualification after that. And and in this case, we couldn't investigate it during the race. So yeah. it, for, for me, it's the only case where we can investigate after the race because uh, we, can't, we can't know during, during the event. So yeah. Franco. Last time you were on, you had only just raced in Bahrain. Perhaps the Colapinto name wasn't so well known back then. Since then, you've won Imola. You've just taken another trophy. You're now P7 in the standings, and you've scored the most points for Van Amersfoort across F2 and F3. How's the season going compared to your expectations? It's going pretty well, to be honest. And, uh, I mean, I'm overall quite happy with with the results, uh, of course, with the performance. Uh, I mean, we are still re- learning every weekend and we are still making some mistakes because we are, of course, both uh, me and the team rookies. Uh, and we have a lot to learn, but uh, to be honest, we are doing a, a great job together. We are just learning more about the car, learning more about the championship, just trying to understand uh, better how, how how we can take the maximum performance out of the car, uh, out of the... Um, uh, out of out of everything, you know, out of the package that we have. So it's going quite well. Uh, of course, we also had some diff- difficult weekends, some tough ones, but uh, I'm overall quite happy with how is everything going, with, with how uh, we are improving weekend by weekend. And when we are uh, struggling, uh, it's good to, to also have those weekends to, to understand why is that happening, to have more information and to, to let's say, have that experience that we are missing of why things are not going in the right direction or why the car is not doing what we were expecting. So it's also positive, you know, in, in most of the aspects. I would say, and this might sound not negative, but I didn't expect a new team to come in and be picking up silverware already. That was, that's not to be offensive to your ability or to the team's ability. You're obviously so well stored in feeder series. But you have, you've won a race, you've just picked up another podium and you are high and higher than some experienced drivers in the championship. Are you really thinking this is how well you'd be doing so far in the season? Uh, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of trust, trust in the team and of, of course, that after we've seen how it was the first weekend, 
uh, my expectations were quite high after that. Maybe not while we were going to Bahrain, but as, as I was coming back from there, uh, my expectations grew up a little bit. Uh, and since then, of course, we had a win, we had a podium, we had some good races, some difficult weekends as well, where we didn't have a lot of knowledge of the track, uh, where we are learning about different compounds of the tires, where we are struggling sometimes with pressure, sometimes with, with car balance, and when sometimes we are just uh, having the perfect package and, and we can maximize and have a good weekend as, as the one we had in, in Red Bull Ring. Uh, so, so as I said before, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to be a new team with a new driver as well that both don't really have any experience in such a difficult, such a competitive championship and also competing uh, against teams that are really, really strong like Prema, Trident, DRT that, that they have been here for many, many years and that they have uh, all the data, all the information that is just so important, you know, in such a short weekend where you almost have no running uh, and you, you just have four laps before qualifying. To have all the data and ready to go, uh, it's just much more easy than, than what we are actually doing. But it's a, a really good work by, by all the team, by Van Amersfoort, and it's just a great effort from everyone, yeah. It really is. And you're saying about some of the established teams. I'm just looking at the team's standings at the moment. We've... Phantom has fought sixth in the standings ahead of, as you mentioned, established teams like Carlin, Campos, Jenza, and Sheru. Oh, some terrific effort. Well done. We need to talk also now, Percy, that the championship's just gone past its halfway point. And at the top, there's one point between two Frenchmen and Leclerc, basically French in P3. Good times for your country. Does it matter to you who wins and who's your money on? Yeah, for sure. Uh, when I watch Formula 3, I'm the happiest man alive, you, you, you can get. <laughs> because, yeah, I follow Victor Martins and Isaac Hadjar's career since they are like 14 years old or something like that. So I, I'm really proud to see them performing at such a level now. And now, even if I, if I love them both, uh, both of them, I have to admit I'm a bit more cheering for Isaac Hadjar because... First, he's younger and uh, he seems to have a greater room for improvement compared to Martins. And, uh, and so you just got to love this guy because he, his personality, his character, uh, we need people like this in Formula One. It's so refreshing, you know, uh, and I really think Red Bull loves this kind of personalities, this kind of yeah, strong personalities that could become ambassadors of, of Red Bull, of, of the brand Red Bull. And uh, now on the, on the most sportive level uh, if i had to bet on someone for the title i would go also for for isaac so, sorry franco but uh, i would go for isaac <laughs> uh, because yeah he's a rookie driver and as a rookie driver uh, his first rounds should have been much more complicated he should have struggled and not be he shouldn't have been fighting against uh, experienced driver like martins like leclerc uh, it should have been the case only later in the year and uh, but it was not the case. He has always been fighting with them since uh, the first race uh, of the year. And also, there's been a, a real progression from him. From him, If you compare the, the first races in Bahrain, in Imola, and now what he's achieving at the moment, uh, like, like, like this weekend, because it has been a, there has been a real upgrade. And uh, yeah, you know, there's more and more pressure also coming around him from the, from the fans, from the social networks. But more importantly, from Helmut Marco, who uh, his ultimate boss, who uh, who said recently to the French magazine uh, Auto Hebdo that if he continued performing like this uh, next year in Formula Two, he would go to F1 in 2024. So first, that means Isaac Adjar will go to F2 next year. Well, I didn't have a lot of doubts about it, but uh, now that Helmut Marco say is saying it, uh, I tend to believe him. Uh, and now, yeah. Uh, Second, uh, that means Isaac Adjar, at 17 years old, is in contention for a Formula One seat. Uh, yeah, it's quite, it's quite incredible. But uh, but don't get me wrong, because Martins and Leclerc are also incredible drivers, uh, and they can pull up incredible performances. But yeah, they are already 21, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they have more experience and. And uh, I don't really see them in F1 in the future. Maybe, maybe they will prove me wrong. But 
I think Martins is behind Piastri and behind Jack Duhan in uh, Alpine's mind. Mm -hmm. And Leclerc is behind Schumacher, probably behind Oli Berman too in Ferrari's mind because Oli Berman has also a, a greater room for improvement. He's younger. But anyway, I think both of them, Martins and Leclerc, will become world-class drivers in other categories because, yeah, they have an incredible talent. Uh, it's, it's a fact. But yeah, for Formula One, I think uh, Isaac Ajal looks uh, to be the big deal. Yeah, it's. I'm just looking for the, the standings as well on this. And you're right, Franco, the quality of drivers you're racing against right now is absolutely terrific. Let's know, like, it is going to be the best quality grid that you've raced against so far. And that's no disrespect to previous championships you've been in, but some of the names at the top, uh, which you're amongst as well, it's really, really impressive. And just apologize on my behalf, calling anybody from Monaco French. It's just, you know, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're near enough there, share the coast and everything. Um, Franco, you probably didn't see a lot of it unless you were looking in mirrors the whole time, but the end of the feature race went a little bit wild. I'm not sure how much of it you did see, but it was surprising to me to see such relatively well-behaved running in such terrible conditions up until that point. How hard is that car to drive in the wet? Because when we got to the end of the race, it went wild. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and I think at the beginning of the race, everyone was trying to be a bit careful, you know, just uh, trying to go through those those first laps to go through that first part of the race that was where there was going to be the biggest shower and where there was going to be the most amount of water on the track. And I think everyone did quite well. Of course, when, when you have a slightly better car that you can find a little bit more grip is a little bit more easy. Um, in my case, I was having a lot of aqua planing because our car was quite low uh, and also the pressures were slightly too low. So uh, it was quite difficult to be flat in the straights due to the amount of water that there was there. And it was a bit tricky at the beginning. Then when the truck started to dry out, it was getting a little bit more easy. Um, but still, you know, it was a, a very tricky race. Of course, I tried to take the, the maximum opportunities I can and just to, to avoid making any mistakes is a key in this kind of, of situations and just to take any any opportunity that you can, any mistake that the guy in front is doing. And in the end, I won quite a few positions so just by staying in my position and trying to be consistent. 10 points on Saturday, 8 points on Sunday. That's a pretty decent haul. Uh, one final thing on F3 for this week. There was an Instagram post from the F3 account asking fans for their driver of the weekend. And I don't know if you saw Franco, but approximately 99.9999% of them was the Argentinian flag. Are you finding that the support is growing every single race? Yeah, Jimmy, it's absolutely massive. You know, the, the Argentinian fans are going wild out there since the beginning of the, of the year, since Bahrain. And they are just getting more and more and more into it. So yeah, it's just really happy, you know, to, to have such a amazing fans behind and, and you know so, so much people pushing and supporting every weekend uh, since since I started this year in, in F3. So really happy about it, of course. Really grateful to to have all these Argentinians following behind, and it's really nice to to have this kind of support. I know from our side, because we're doing this podcast right now, that the English level of support, but are you getting a lot of attention with doing calls back home? And are you, have you been back to Argentina so far this year to go and do any in-show, in like in-person appearances? No, not really. I've been all year in Europe at the moment. And, and yeah, I mean, maybe I did some media there, but not, not really a lot, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, it looks like, you know, when, when they only have one driver in, in Europe, in a championship that is close to Formula One, uh, the country is just pushing a lot for that one, basically, almost one opportunity that they have. So, you know, it's really nice to see all the support and, and all the people that is, that is pushing for me. You know, it's really, really nice and gives me, honestly, a lot of power, you know, to keep going, to, to keep pushing and, and, of course, to keep improving every weekend. 
Austria wasn't the only venue with racing this weekend as Frecker returned. And for the first time in 2022, neither of the two winners were named Beganovic, Mini or Aaron. Hadrian David and Cass Havercourt took victories with Cass's first in Frecker. I had a busy weekend and I've not been able to catch up on everything, but can you talk us through the Frecker goings on, please, Percy? Yeah, as, uh, and as you said, yeah, for the first time of the season, neither ART, neither Prima won the races. So it's quite uh, quite historical uh, because it's cast of a quote, as you said, for Van Amers Fort Racing uh, and uh, Hadrian David for our race who took the wins. And uh, yeah, that's uh, des- that's definitely so important for for them for because they desperately needed this to to keep their title hopes alive. Uh, but more importantly, they are still in the title battle because uh, this weekend was a nightmare for Dino Beganovic, uh, the the so dominant Freke leader of this year, scored only six little points. Uh, while in the same time, Gabriele Mini closed the gap in, in the standings with uh, two second places. And um, which makes him, in my opinion, the, the real winner of the of the weekend. And uh, and also on a track that uh, all teams had to discover because the Hungar ring was not uh, in last year's Freke calendar. Uh, the new Trident team has been quite, or even strongly impressive uh, with their three rookie drivers, Roman Bilinski, Leonardo Fornaroli and Tim Tramnitz. Uh, they were constantly fighting for podiums and for, for big points and all that. And... Uh, and I think that this weekend can be a, a really great uh, breakthrough for them in, in this season and in, in, their, in their history for, for the future because they are really growing uh, as a team. And I really think that they can, they can fight with, the, with ART, with RS Prima in the future, maybe even next year, I think. That would be uh, a sight to see, wouldn't it? I'm looking at the, the standings of this as well. And you're right, the... <laughs> The difference this weekend without Kramer and ART dominating was notable. Um, just a point because you mentioned Belinsky there. Franco, we've got Sergeant Fittipaldi, Duan in F2, Hajar Behrman, yourself in F3. But Freca doesn't look to have any rookies near the top of the standings, although a shout out to Belinsky for taking the podium. Why do you think that is? Is that an age thing? Is it Tatas versus Delara? Is it downforce? Why, why do you think the Formula 3 and Formula 2 championships are having the rookies succeed so much more? Yeah, I think the, the Formula regional car is, is quite different to, to all what the drivers are actually used to. So uh, it maybe makes a bit more, more difference on the second year drivers. Um, and you know that when you are coming from, from F4 as well, it's the first year that you are actually in a quite powerful car, in a quite you know, big car with some downforce. And of course, and then when you are going up to F3, it's a little bit more of the same. It's, it's pretty much the same car, uh, a bit more downforce as well, some more power, but it's not a massive difference. The biggest difference is always from F4 to, to regional or to Euro Formula. That is, of course, where the drivers are making the, the biggest difference in the second year. Uh, the difficult, the, I mean, what is difficult from F3 is that you don't have almost almost any running before qualifying, and that's what the drivers are not used to. Um, in Even in, in Freca, they are running a lot before qualifying. They have a lot of time to know the track, a lot of time to just understand the car a little bit better, just to make some setup changes. Uh, that's what you don't have in F3, and that's the difficult part of, of F3 and, and of F2 as well. Uh, I think that's the most difficult part of, of our championship, and of course, of the Formula Regional, when you're coming from F4 into a much bigger car, much more physical car, uh, you have to be uh, much more ready in a way and you have to understand that quite quickly. That's why I think the second year drivers just make a, a little bit more of a difference in the rest of the of the championships. Are you struggling this year? And this isn't critical at all because you're clearly not struggling, but are you struggling to adapt to the lack of track time that you have been used to? Mm, not really to the lack of track time. Uh, there are some some drugs that I don't know, and I've not been testing during the year in in any other car. Uh, do, do in between races that many drivers are doing, so that's in a way where I'm missing a little bit maybe in some of the drugs that I I've never been before. 
uh, and when you only have four push-ups and four qualies, it's a bit tricky on that on that sense uh, compared to others that have been testing there or have raced before. Um, but yeah, it's just something that you just have to learn how to be a bit more on the scene, maybe use all that preparation possible to to make the most out of it and, and be ready in the first push-up of the weekend that will be in free practice, of course, just to try to to take all the maximum information and, and maximum uh, amount of knowledge that you can since the beginning of the of the of the weekend that will be the most important as you have just so much uh, short track time. I, I'd like to say it's also because uh, of the teams that rookies are are, st are struggling in Freke this year because uh, this year there are very few rookies in uh, top teams aside Sebastian Montoya in Prema and uh, Lawrence Van Hulpen in ART. Uh, but at the same time, we really see some incredible drives for for the last for the final points or in the midfield uh, with of course the Trident drivers uh, as we talked about it before. Uh, with uh, Josh Dufek uh, for Van Amersfoort Racing again, uh, who is really progressing, and uh, Joshua Dirksen for Arden, uh, Matteo Capieto of course for Monolite, and uh, uh, they are in little or uh, they are in smaller teams uh, than uh, compared to uh, to the to Prima, ERT, etc. And really, I, I can't wait for for them for Dufek, Dirksen, Capieto, and all that to join top teams uh, next year because they. In my opinion, they would directly be title con contenders if they join the right teams. And uh, yeah, if they join ART, Ares, Prema, uh, and I would say even Tridon, uh, I think they could, uh, they, they would be very dangerous for the title. Very good points as well, Percy. Thanks for bringing that up. Final thing on Freca, because it's crazy to say it, but the season only has four weekends left, although. That's going way into October, so we've still got a while before it finishes. Championship has suddenly closed up between Mini and Boganovic at the top. Is it a two-horse race, or can Aaron or Hadrian David, as you mentioned, or even going down to Cass Havercourt, is a championship open enough for that, or do you think it's going to be Dino versus Gabrielli at the top? The, um, the easy answer would be to say, uh, yeah, it's between Beganovic and Mini because they have been the, the two main drivers of uh, this season so far and they have taken nearly all the wins. Uh, but uh, I, 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 don't, I, uh, I think the championships is, is much more open and, and for me, it's a five drivers battle because uh, so with Beganovic, Mini, Aaron, David and have a court. Uh, because after Monaco, uh, or, or even after Paul Ricard, after the Paul Ricard weekend, uh, Beganovic had a 63 points lead in front of the driver in P2. Uh, but a disqualification for a technical infringement uh, happened. And then there was the Zen Volt weekend where Paul Aaron was absolutely flying. And, uh, and finally, this Hungarian weekend uh, uh, for, for Beganovic, which, uh, which was a, a nightmare. And uh, standings can change so quickly. Uh, and if David and Havercourt can keep up the pace they had in Hungary, uh, go to the podiums, go win the races and all that, uh, they can have their chances to, to, to win at the end of the year. Uh, but now, of course, they are not the favorites, but uh, they are still there. Uh, they are ready, uh, ready to win at any occasion. But for sure, the top three uh, still seems to be ahead of them. Uh, and it's very hard to say which one of Beganovic, uh, Mini and Aaron will get the title because depending on the weekend, the hierarchy uh, between the three drivers changed completely. So I think we should be able to get a title battle till the last race of the season. And that's a pretty big change compared to last year where Gregor Sossi just ran away with the title uh, uh, three or four races before the end of the championship. And yeah, that's a pretty enjoyable change for, for all the racing fans. Franka, do you keep on top of, like, do you keep in touch with what's going on with Freck, or are you thinking, no, I'm focusing on my future right now? Yeah, I do. I also watch a lot of the Euro Formula that Oli is racing there. Mm. Uh, mine last year, and uh, I've been helping him in, in F4 as well, so I'm really a friend of him, and he's on the top of the championship, so I'm used to, to watch sometimes the Euro Formula, sometimes the Freck, the Freck as well. Uh, of course, it's you know quite nice to watch also my own team, well, uh, Van Amersfoort and uh, Gas. I think this weekend doing quite well, winning some races. So uh, yeah, really nice to watch them. Of course, uh, 
we are also going to race in Ongar Ring uh, in our next round. So also good to watch the races and, and watch how how they were doing some moves and, of course, trying to learn a little bit of them. That's really good to hear. Like, I really like the idea that you're a racing driver who will be racing and when you're not racing, you're just watching racing or <laughs> helping out even yeah. younger drivers. Yeah, every weekend watching races, non-stop. Well, that's enough questions from us because the F1 Feeder Series podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. And in particular now, because all of a sudden, a wild Jack Doohan has turned up as well. So we've got two people. Unfortunately, you've been asking questions to both of them and there's been a bucket load. We're moving on to the part of the podcast where you have your say with hashtag AskF1FS. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. Question number one comes from Chloe Grace Hickman via Instagram, and this is for you, Jack. How do you deal with team orders and racing with your teammates when you're racing for yourself? And is it any different from F3 into F2? Well, usually, you know, especially in, in Formula 3 and Formula 2, uh, team orders specifically as for for driver changes of positions um, don't really occur so often due to us, you know, obviously trying to create the best result for ourselves and on more of the basis that we're paying. Um, <laughs> so that plays a, a big part into obviously, you know, your career as well as, as much as, you know, you're on the Formula 2 and you're on the Formula 3 package is included with Formula 1, a lot of people who, who cannot be there, you know, look at statistics, look at stats, look at the data. And um, if you have to conceive a victory due to the team orders um, for one reason or another, and it comes up, you know, on the data that comes up with P2, there's no side note saying, oh, was leading the whole race, but gave the, the victory to a teammate for team orders, should have won the race, dot, dot, dot. Um, it just says P2 and the other guy, P1. Um, so if the situation is, you know, to last year in Sochi, I think it was quite a unique circumstance. And to be honest, I've never experienced something like that. And I don't think until um, if the opportunity comes to go to Formula One, something like that will obviously happen again, which will be uh, completely different than than how, obviously, you know, that was, that was handled last year. Uh, but, you know, there's the the famous you know unwritten or written rule depending on what team you are obviously to not crash into your teammate and, and to race fair um which is uh you know a lot of a lot of irony comes with it because your teammates are the first person you want to beat so it's um it's very uh, a, a weird and, and touchy subject but you know team orders i i don't think it's a, a huge part in in our junior c junior um single seater categories uh however uh, i don't think it would change um depending formula two to formula three is this a written rule at Virtuosi? To not crash into your teammate? Uh -huh. um, no, but I just know that you wouldn't dare um, come back to, to Andy Roach or Paul Devlin, <laughs> or, or Devlin after um, anything like that. So, And it was more so Abu Dhabi last year. Obviously, I'd signed with Virtuosi before before going into the final two rounds, and um, when me and Joe were were fighting on the on the first lap, and uh, you know I tried to stay around the outside of the turn ten, I think it is, and um, coming back onto the track, you know I, the potential could have been to touch the wheels, so I, I I jammed on the brakes, and that was more to the case that I'm not going to take out the, the team that I'm joining literally <laughs> in about in an hour's time, um, and. Unfortunately, that ended up with me in the wall, but a happy Andy and 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 rest of the team. So that's, that's uh, the main thing. Exactly. <laughs> Percy, I know you had a question just for Franco as well. Yeah, yeah, I had a question because uh, Franco, you had a full season in endurance last year alongside uh, your three K campaign. Uh, so you did the twenty four hours of Le Mans. You won the four hours of the Castellet. Uh, does this experience help you in your in your F three uh, season? Yeah, it definitely did. Uh, of course, there are many different things, you know, in endurance compared to sprint racing, but uh, there was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of new things for me uh, in, in endurance that I learned, uh, you know, with great teammates that I had. I was running in the same car with, with the Breeze, and it was a, 
a great guy to have with me in my in my first season of endurance and uh, of course i did learn a lot of new a lot of new stuff uh, some of it went into into formula as well uh, and into my driving of course uh, it helped me to to just improve a little bit in in some of my race craft and, and of course into the strategy during, during the races I, as you know the pirellis are are really really difficult in f3 and to 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 basically have that experience in endurance you know where you have to do three stints maybe or at least two in a race with the same tires and trying to save a lot of fuel it in some way helped me to 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 kind of have a better understanding of how to to save those pirellis and of course arrive to, to the end of the race with a bit more tire left it's not only that a lot of a lot of more stuff going on during those races that it did help me during during the season in f3 i love the fact that racing drivers race across different championships and i really wish we could see more of it i know there's obviously a lot of cost implications but i think it's great to see uh, another question just for both of you this is from matty frontini via instagram let's go with you first jack what is your best and worst memory while racing? Um, best memory. I, I think my best memory, you know, obviously all wins are, are good and all wins are, um, uh, you know, there's obviously, you know, not actually, if I think about it, not just think about a win because there's a lot of memories. Um, I think, you know, that, that feeling of, of such a tough year in 2020 and, mm -hmm. um, and nothing really obviously going right at all. And then, in, you know, jumping, jumping into the Trident, um, also not only just the car, then, you know, having that opportunity to, to learn so much off Giacomo Ricci um, and, and for him to, to teach me uh, uh, so much uh, of, of what then was portrayed in the, in the 2021 season. But being able to, to, to jump into that car and being able to to further my potential really you know unlock it and um and fine-tune things uh you know scrape off the edges make make things more uh, rounded and perfected and realizing then that you know you have the pace and you have the the potential to to fight for wins fight for podiums and, and fight for a championship as a memory and as a feeling I, i'd say um you know knowing that now that you have uh, the capability worst memory would be uh, worst memory, I think on my way to my first Formula 4 win uh, in Thruxton, British F4, um, and halfway, one lap to go, like a four-second lead, and halfway around the lap, yeah, my exhaust broke. Um, and, yeah, finished, I think, P12. Um, so that firstly, also Asian F3, um it had like a number of technical issues through the first three rounds and for the last last two rounds i had to win all six races to win the championship and i been in sepang we double polled and had the triple win and then Burium as well the double pole and both first two races on the final lap i had a random rear right tire puncture from no contact and yeah there's a number but those are um a little bit of just a bit of bad luck. Standout moments. How about you, Franco? Best and worst? You can go in either order, whichever one you want to go first. Well, yeah, fortunately, I have some time to think about it. So thank you, Jack. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, last year for me was quite tough uh, in terms of not only of performance, but in terms of everything going on, you know, with so much racing. And uh, my first year in endurance, uh, those races are, just really tough mentally, you know, there is a lot of stuff going on. Maybe you are P12 during the race and then you finish winning or, or all the other way around. So uh, it was a difficult year for me in terms of everything. Uh, I was a silver driver. I was racing with uh, G-Drive um, and I was basically not doing qualifying in, in, in any of the races because it was Nick, Nick the Breeze, the pro, uh, that he was doing an amazing job and I learned a lot of him. Uh, but one of the races he couldn't he couldn't do it because there was a clash with Formula E with New York, uh. Uh, and basically another pro another pro came. But uh, I I asked to do quali because I was one of the things that I really want to do. I want to have that uh, you know 
low tanks and new tires. So, you know, feeling the grip, not only doing long runs and, and just thinking about the, the race pace during all the weekend. Uh, so I was lucky to have that opportunity once on, once in the year. Uh, and I would say that that was one of my, my best moments in, in racing, just to, mm. to put it on pole in that one, one chance I've got with, with the team and in LMP2 uh, by like five tenths in, in Monza. So uh, I was really happy after that pole. For me, you know, qualifying is one of the most important uh, parts of the weekend and where you get the most satis satisfaction out, uh, where you put everything together in one lap and where you are just... Uh, you and the car, where you are feeling all the grip and, and just giving the max and, and taking everything out of the car. So, yeah, it was a really nice feeling as well as Bahrain in my first race of F3 and, and putting it on pole. So, uh, were some really nice moments. Uh, going to the worst, uh, I would say Le Mans was, was one of the worst and one of the most, you know, tricky uh, times in, in my career so far. Uh, we were winning, but we were in contention to, for the win. We were there around with the top three during all the race, maybe some safety cars and, you know, maybe you would lose some track position, but we were just there between five seconds of, of, of everyone in the top three. Uh, and I had a crash during the night in my fourth stint in a row uh, where we were, I think, P2 or, or P3. Uh, and we lost a race there, unfortunately, where we could, I think, have won it, uh, seeing the pace that we had during the rest of the race. So, yeah, it was a really tough moment, of course. And when you have such a big team behind you, so much people working for that one race, and and you have three drivers, you have a, a full amount of people behind working on that, working on, 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 on that result and just, uh, a lot of stuff going on behind and then you are the one doing the that little mistake or maybe that little moment that you lost some some attention and and you just had a little contact that made you lose a race uh, so it's one one of those moments in endurance that is really tricky you know for the drivers yeah i can imagine uh, having to go back to the, the garage after that perhaps this question from taco cat may help and Question to both of you as well. Again, Jack, let's go first with you. They want me to ask both if they sleep with socks on or not. Very important, hard-hitting questions from F1 Feeder Series. Jack, do you sleep with socks on? No way. <laughs> There's no, no elaboration needed. Just no. Um, yeah, for... If he... Yeah, no. <laughs> Franco. Just so unexpected. <laughs> oh, mate, neither. Like, no way. I think I no. never slept with socks in my life. So. Uh, mm. Not really. Just with a pair of boxers on it. <laughs> okay. They, they didn't ask Franco, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All the Argentinian fans are very happy. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <I love> <laughs> Listen, Franco, I know time is pushed for you, so I'm going to let you go. Do you have any message for your Argentinian friends? Yeah, I mean, just a massive thanks, you know, to, to all of them, to, to everyone uh, supporting me this, this year. It's been amazing, the, the support of, of all the Argentinian fans. And, you know, it's pushing me a lot as well to, to just keep progressing, keep, keep pushing me and the team, you know, to, to, to have some good results this year. Uh, so it's... It's really nice to to have your own country pushing you behind and and giving you so much power to to go forward. That's excellent to to hear. Um, I'll let you go, and then we'll bully we'll bully Jack for a little bit for being so late. So thank you, Franco. We'll have you back on the podcast. You've been terrific once again. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Great to be here again and see you. Okay, so Jack, this question comes from Lara. And then it's also Max Verstappen 2021 F1 champ. So I wonder who they support. Do you Lewis. get on with your <laughs> Lewis. Do you get on well with your teammates? And do you guys meet apart from at the racetrack? Um, I get along with Marina very well. Um, 
basically just because he's a, a really nice guy, uh, you know, seriously, uh, just super down to earth, um, no issues at all, just uh, very genuine and, and is, you know, is always as well when things obviously when he's having a super difficult season himself, finding what works for him and, and getting an under, getting a good base for himself, uh, you know, uh, whenever I do well or, or it goes, you know, I have a good qualifying session or, or a good race is, um, you know, always says good job, always, sh you know, shakes my hand um, and, and is never in, um, never in fury or, or never in jealousy. Uh, and, you know, is just always looking on, on what he can do better. Um, and yeah, you know, he's a really cool guy as well outside of the circuit. So uh, luckily he lives in Monaco as well. So, you know, if we're both there, uh, he's there with so occasionally some Japanese friends, um, and, and he, he goes home when he can as well. So if we're both there and we're, uh, at the same time, then we'll definitely go grab a bite to eat or, or go get some dinner. Do you have any sort of relationship with the Alpine drivers as well? Like that you get to see them or hang out with them? Um, no, when, when I, if I go to Enzo and I'm at the factory staying in Oxford, um, I'll catch up with, with Kayo, um, Kayo or Ollie, or, or if the boys are around, we'll, we'll definitely catch up. Um, but as Kayo, Kayo, Ollie, and Oscar obviously live um, live in Oxford, and uh, uh, Victor's obviously in Paris, um, so he's only there um, from time to time. But uh, no, when I do go, I, I catch up with them with them guys, and we um, we're obviously at the factory during the day together, and then um, we'll, we'll go get a bite to eat. I can imagine some of those uh, those conversations would be brilliant to be a fly on the wall with uh, with all you guys having a bite to eat, talking about traveling all around the world but i won't go into that it's a family safe podcast <laughs> <laughs> um this one comes from damien and wants to know for jack you have now been a part of two different junior academies can you tell us any difference between them both um i think they're both <clears throat> both obviously great uh, academies um i think definitely it's you know it's driver driver opinion uh and it's definitely comes down to to himself or, or herself and, and what they want out of an, an academy basically you know and what they're looking for and for me it was uh you know in order to grow further and um further my potential and capabilities in in normal you know in normal circumstances as a as a human being um and and also as a as a racing driver so uh, when the opportunity with Alpine came available at the end of the last year, um, you know, my initial obviously decision or my initial my initial feeling was, you know, I'm 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 happy where I am. I, I'm with Red Bull, um, and as you know, as we know, obviously the the rate of of transition to Formula One has not been as high as other academies. So initially, as an outsider, uh, not knowing so much about the academy, you would think, well. As a driver currently, my goal is Formula One, and I, I want to be in a position where I can be promoted to that. Uh, but after you know looking into the details and, and the opportunities that I would be re that I would be receiving and, and be given, uh, it was almost um, you know almost a, a no brainer as the, the opportunities that I've already be gi been given to date. Um, you know, not only just in, in Formula One tests, but the the availability to be learning off of all the engineers and the test team of the Formula One team and, and also on a wider branch of of the LM, LMP, um, LMP project as well and of what they have for the future. So it's not just, you know, Formula One and, and a sole focus on that. Obviously, that is my current goal and, and our goal together, but as well, the availability of, you know, not everyone obviously makes it to Formula One. So they're trying to build other areas for, for drivers to go to. Was it a question, and I don't know how much you can go into it, but it's something I've been curious about because generally you see a lot of drivers stick with an academy. So my question to you is, do, and if you can speak to it, did Alpine like start knocking on the door? Like you said, you were the one who were considering it, but it doesn't sound like you were unhappy enough to leave this time last year. No. Um, yeah, I was you know, going to be sticking with Red Bull um, for, for the season and Alpine, been, you know, made an offer for us to, to move to, to their academy in the beginning of September of last year. Huh. And it wasn't till I think the middle of October that I, I went up to the factory, um, still not signed uh, with Alpine, but they, they just gave me the opportunity to, to go to the factory, 
uh, see see the vibe really and, and the atmosphere and 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 how I felt uh, around the team and and what they could really what they could really do for them, um, what they could do for me, what I could do for them, and uh, it was kind of after my first day there. Really, I, I knew I was I was quite uh, certain of, of where I wanted to be. Did Fernando Alonso let you in on El Plan? Um, that is uh, El Private. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> right. uh, Jeff, uh, yeah, I wanted to continue a bit, uh, about this uh, this team because uh, when you join Alpine, uh, is did the fact that Alpine has a F1 team, of course, but also if an endurance program really convinced you to to join them because uh, we know Red Bull is really focused on Formula One and uh, if if you are not uh, good enough in, uh, in uh, for, for Almut Marco uh, you don't have uh, any future and you have nothing left uh, does the fact that Alpine has an endurance program uh, invest a lot on the hypercar uh, on the hypercar project uh, does this uh, give you a, a, a kind of second plan a plan b uh if formula one doesn't work yeah it, you know firstly it, it wasn't the reason that i joined the program um was to the fact that you know i will have a plan b um as you know my plan a will will continue until failed and but um as a driver you know knowing that 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 they're they're available for that and, and that is almost what they're trying to do is create a platform where for one reason or another, you know, they, you know, they can see that the drivers they have or, or, or current or selected drivers that they know have the potential, but, you know, especially in Formula 2, Formula 3, a, a lot of things have to, have to gel, have to, to go right, you know, for obviously that, that ultimate goal to happen. And so on some occasions, um, you know, we've seen plenty of drivers and, and very talented um, and very talented ones not make it to the, to the pinnacle of, of motorsport being Formula One, so what they're trying to do is create a, a pathway for, for you know those, those drivers to be able to continue a, a career and create create um create themselves a, a, a lifetime of you know endurance or whether that be their, their future programs that they have um in the works so that they're not only just left with with nothing and 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 as themselves you know obviously they've been especially Kyo Victor. And, and Oscar, they've been in the program for many, many years. So for them to get up, make it to, to Formula 2 or in the, the high moments of Formula 3, and then all of a sudden they just don't make it to Formula 1, so they're not in the program anymore, it, it doesn't really make sense. That's a very good point. And I remember speaking to Lawrence Barreto last year, he pointed out just how much track time you get when you're a part of the Alpine uh, side of things as well, which you get into the Formula One car. So there is a lot to be said for that. The next question comes from, oh, I have to read this out, Aina, then a sun emoji, waiting for Daniel's slap ass again. Thank you, Aina, for whatever that Twitter name is. But... I ask you, Jack, we have seen you have a close relationship with Daniel Ricciardo. So they're wondering, does he give you any constructive thoughts for your races? Is he someone that you can turn to for advice if you need it? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, 100% someone that I could, that I could turn to for advice and, um, and really pick his brain because uh, he's, you know, done so much. And although, you know, still, young but not in a, in a formula one perspective um has done a lot and has been around the block of formula one and also junior junior single seeders um so he's got a lot of knowledge uh, a lot of brain power obviously things aren't going um you know 100 percent amazing for him at the moment in, in this set in time but that doesn't you know that doesn't dictate his talent or, or what he's done when he's been in, you know, in machinery, uh, willing to to fight. Obviously, when he was in the Red Bull. Next question comes from Morgs, and they say, "Were you surprised when your dad wasn't in Park Ferme this weekend after the sprint race, or did you already know he's going to be on the podium handing out the trophies? It was such a cute moment." No, I had. To be honest, when he wasn't in, in Park Ferme, I just thought that, you know, fair play. It's only a, a sprint race, you know, a, a P3 on a sprint race is obviously either, um, you know, 
got more important things to be doing either with with meetings within the paddock or or just you know couldn't get to the podium so it wasn't a a, a big drama for me um as you know we we were out of place in qualifying so i was quite confident with our result that could have been on, on sunday uh so I, I thought he was obviously just having um you know <laughs> High hopes, and uh, but no, it was uh, it was amazing then to see him when I went up in, onto the podium and, and to see him there with with DC and Mark. So, and obviously for him to be presenting me a few it was quite cool. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a moment like that in motorsport before. Like I'm just trying to rack my brains if I saw it, if I seen it in Formula One, but I can't think of anything like that. That's going to be something to stick with you for a while. I I imagine. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, nothing, you know, it was obviously the last thing I was expecting. I really wasn't expecting anything at all. But for, for my own father to, to hand me the trophy, it was, it was quite cool. Yeah, I saw the, uh, some of the photographs as well, just everybody laughing about it. It was, uh, it was really <laughs> fun. Um, this one comes from Ida, and it's to Jack to say, do you plan on growing your hair back? Uh, they're asking for a friend. A friend. <laughs> um for the current time no uh just because it's so easy um you know, <laughs> laziness is your driving factor <laughs> it's it's um you know i every two weeks I, I just shave my hair at home in the bathroom and, and it's done and dusted it's the same all the time uh, especially you know coming into summer season it's not hot and sweaty um it, it's just easy wake up in the morning look the same um and and you know nothing needs to be done it's, it's very easy for training for driving um symmetrical both sides so it's uh, at the moment i can't see myself um going back to the long hair i love it's that aerodynamic aussie <laughs> exactly very aero um can't wait for spar and monza so be honest it jack be is good. it because you can't be doing it by yourself because you can't afford the monaco uh barber prices <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I cannot afford for to be charged um, fifty to hundred euros for a buzz cut. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that being the truth as well. Um, <laughs> you probably got asked this quite a lot, and I don't want to focus all that much on it. But Omaris Bomiradi asks, out of curiosity, why did you pursue a career in car racing, the motorcycle racing, like your dad? And I want to just question because I don't know how it overlap this is on my side did you what like, were you watching your dad winning titles like what was the age difference there no so i i was um dad retired in 1999 um just before my sister was born not on purpose due to his crash in hereth and i was born in 2003 no, so i wasn't difference. able to experience um any of my dad's racing moments and uh yeah i think that I was first introduced to bikes at two and then um, <laughs> dad was, dad was a, you know, dad and, and Michael Schumacher were, were close friends at the time, um, mainly because of the fact that in 1994, uh, dad just won his first world title and, and it was living in Monaco and he was out on his balcony one morning and he looks to the right and, and Michael was, was living in the balcony next to him. And Michael had just won his first world championship as well on, on four wheels. So their relationship really started from there and, Michael uh, gifted me and my sister two carts uh, for Christmas uh, when we were three as a as a direction to really go. Do not go on the two wheels and to go towards more <laughs> towards more four wheels. <laughs> yeah, um, but no. Until um, until I was around seven years old, I I loved two wheels, and um, until I was five, I wanted to race two wheels. I was riding all the time, and. And uh, injury on my birthday where I broke my leg quite badly, which scared me uh, at a young age. Um, but I was still wanting to to p- pursue something. And but being said, at such a young age, a couple of my friends from school were were karting, and um, I, I wanted to. Obviously, I'd, I'd had the opportunity from from a young age to be able to kart, and it was something that I wanted to pursue um, and you know have fun with my mates with while doing. Uh, so we decided to to start racing when I was eight in, in karting, and it really just went from there. And it's very insightful. I could imagine the stories of, uh, of Schumacher and uh, and Mick going around Monaco and painting the town red. So, yeah, we'll <laughs> keep it family safe again. I'll stress that. We don't have to hear about that. Um, let's go on this final question. 
because you weren't here to talk about the Formula 2 side of uh, this weekend. And obviously, when we were speaking about that, track limits came up once or twice. So Adrian King has asked, has the enforcement of track limits gone too far? What is the driver's, or in your case, in this case, the driver reaction to this weekend's penalties? Um, well, I think, it, um, you know, the, the track limits are the track limits at the end of the day. And um, unfortunately, you know, I would like to say it's gone too far. Um, we are briefed of, of what they are and where they're supposed to be. As much as, you know, it's it's strange and, and not consistent, unfortunately, um, it, it is what it is. And it's, a, a you know, a non-negotiable, it's a non-appealable um, penalty. So it was more to the case on, on, on my side as, you know, we obviously went com- with a completely wrong strategy on the, on the weekend. Um, wanting to, to go to slicks, um, you know, for the start of the race. And for, for one reason or another, um, we went we went with wets, and uh, which was obviously completely the wrong call. Um, there was a chance of rain 15 minutes into the race, um, but it was you know when on my laps to the grid, it, it was dry, and then even the 10 minutes later, it was completely dry. So, and you know we went a, a step in for the wet direction as well on, on the grid. So. For me, it was like a, a, a wet, especially when we boxed for, for dry tires, um, it was a wet car. And so it didn't help me at all. And, you know, I, I did a, a number of track limits. And, um, and yeah, it was quite a, a, a difficult race. Uh, but in the end, you know, about track limits, it, it's, a, it's an issue for, for Red Bull Ring, I have to say. And, um, you know, the, they had the sausage curbs there before, um, which were, were quite dangerous. But I think there's another way to implement, you know, you not to, to go over track limits. I think they could do what Spa has done. And, you know, you can put gravel there on the exit and, and say no more, you know, and or original tracks with grass on the exit or, or another solution, not just a white line. And in previous years, it's been the red and white curb. And then now they're dictating it off a, off a white line that we can you know we can barely see the top of the tire and yeah let alone the white line uh, you know dictating the track edge um so there's quite a lot of times where you know honestly i wanted you know over the weekend after free practice i asked to go see the stewards just to see you know on track footage of of what track limits was and on what lap because on from my point of view i would think that my right side tires are on the white line where from a bird's eye view uh, it's not so and that's just literally a perception issue that that unfortunately because we're sitting so low that you cannot see uh, so in order for me to know that all right if i can see the white line between my front right wheel and the the monocoque that is on the edge instead okay. of it being the other way um but uh, yeah you know it, it's difficult but luckily um we don't really have that issue in, in other places yeah, we've got loads of grass at Paul Ricard next up, so that's great. It is, it is fantastic. I'm looking <laughs> forward to that. <laughs> Listen, uh, we will be speaking about Paul Ricard in a couple of weeks on the podcast, but for now, that's all the time that we have. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And if you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. If you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out. And if you are listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those, plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else in the podcast, including Franco, in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye. <laughs>